Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Shrigan Citical video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with NVIDIA, specifically news that a major AIB partner of NVIDIA, one of the Taiwanese Big Three, has been reported to send back 300,000, just going to repeat that, 300,000 GPU cores back to NVIDIA. And why have they done that? Is it because of manufacturing defects? Is it because they fell out with NVIDIA or anything like that? No, it's simply because of demand for the graphics card has dropped off so much because of a couple of reasons. The first and the biggest culprit supposedly is the cryptocurrency craze is well and truly dying. There's a couple of reasons behind that, but one being that the release of ASIC miners, obviously a lot of people who are still mining and want to purchase one of those instead because it gives you better returns. And the second reason is that prices for certain currencies such as Bitcoin have tanked recently. I mean, what, the peak was like, what, 20,000 US dollars? Now it's down to what, seven? That's a considerable difference. So because the prices have diminished, the more casual miners who are just buying like one or two graphics cards every so often, they just can't afford it. They can't justify it because with the cost of electricity and running the GPUs, the uh, return on investment just is not really enough right now. And with the uncertainty in the cryptocurrency market anyway, it's no longer like it was, let's say, six months ago, back, um, let's say, April, May of 2017 to around March-ish of this year, there was certainly a boom in the cryptocurrency craze. And I knew that there was something going to happen because like, it's never a good sign, in my opinion, when someone who doesn't even know about the topic of like technology is like, oh, I, I, how do you mine? Is there a way of mining? And I, I actually had people who could barely turn on a PC ask me, what do you actually need to mine? Uh, how do you mine this currency? And I was like, hmm, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that's going to be an interesting conundrum. But obviously, it is what it is. From what the reports are telling us from Seeking Alpha and um, Semi-Accurate, what we are left with is NVIDIA having a massive back inventory now of hardware. And this, of course, is going to be impacting possibly the release of the next generation G-Forces, which is ultimately why I'm covering this story. From what we're hearing, the next generation of G-Forces are partly being delayed because of this specific reason. NVIDIA want to get rid of some of this back inventory of of GPUs because they don't want it. Like, what else are they going to do with the darn things? You What, you're going to destroy them? You're just going to keep them for the sake of history and prosperity? No, you need to sell them or destroy them. You need to do one of the two. The problem is that gamers, which are going to be off the ones that NVIDIA, of course, are probably going to have to offload these cards to, don't particularly feel that compelled to buy right now. I mean, let's be honest. Would you want to buy a GPU in this particular instance right now? Sure, you might buy a low-end card just for the sake of like having a backup or perhaps you're waiting or perhaps your current GPU's died. Let's say you had a 980 Ti or a 980 or whatever and that card happened to die and you're thinking to yourself, well, I'll buy something in the meanwhile just so I can game and just so I can get by while the next generation is going to be released. That makes sense. But buying a 1080 or a Vega 56 or a Vega 64, considering the price is still a pretty darn high, you might as well just wait for the next generation where we can pretty much presume that you're going to get at least a 50% improvement in performance. Assuming that Ampere or Turing or whatever it's going to be called, it's not just a Pascal refresh with slight clock bumps, and I highly doubt that's going to be the case. My money is it essentially being Volta, but with a lot of the computer oriented stuff cut away. Whether that means the tensor cores or not, well, we'll just have to wait and see. So we're left in this really weird situation, and consider that NVIDIA typically has a really tight rein on its board partners, um, after all, GPP, I'm curious to see how this situation is going to be resolved and if we might see the 11 or 20 series or whatever end up being called, uh, being delayed further. So a topic I covered yesterday was the Threadripper 2990X, which of course is the high-end SKU in the new Threadripper 2 range. It features 32 cores, 64 threads, and I went through the performance results in Cinebench. If you want the information, or rather a full rundown specifications of my performance analysis, you can check out the video which is going to be linked in this video's description. But 
Comanche on Twitter, I actually got a couple of folks messaging me regarding an update to this because there was an, another SKU, another processor that was actually listed in these performance results that, we, that it was blanked out. And obviously we, we didn't know what it was. It was just literally completely and utterly blanked out. And it appears to be Intel's eight core Coffee Lake. Now this is rather interesting because the timing for this coincides with another leak that I covered yesterday regarding Azure the Singularity. We went through the benchmarks results of it on Intel's 8-core Coffee Lake. Now it is an engineering sample. I want to repeat that. It's an engineering sample. It's only running at 3 gigahertz. Previous leaks were at 2.6 gigahertz if memory serves. So uh, those ones are soft Sandra. So obviously Intel are getting more confident in the silicon's quality and now of course it's running at a higher clock speed. It's still not as fast as an 8700K by any stretch of the imagination, but still it's getting better and better and better and better and better and better. So that's obviously a good sign that Intel are slowly getting this thing ready for release. Don't forget that the Xeon E is supposed to, supposedly, excuse me, going to be the first processor that we see uh, the eight cores on and it's on the 1151 socket. So after that, we should see it for the replacements, well, not the replacement, sorry, the addition in the i7, or, well, presumably it's i7, I mean, for all we know, it could be known as the i9-8800K or the whatever. But either way, it's going to be curious. The results are still pretty impressive, though, considering it is only running at 3 gigahertz, uh, 8 core, 16 threads, so it looks like the performance scaling is there. It really is down to a couple of things. One, what is the pricing of these darn things going to be? Are we going to see the 8700K, say, shift down in price, like, let's say, $50, and then this be up, like, another $50 on top? Or are we going to see it just launch at a really impressive price point, like $500 US-ish? If so, AMD have less to concern themselves with, but if the Intel can release it at a fairly good price, it is going to be interesting how AMD are going to be responding. From what we know, and obviously AMD are not giving all of the information regarding their margins, but from what we know, especially with the first generation of Zen processors, AMD had a pretty good margin when it came to production. That's one of the reasons that we've seen so many discounts for the Threadripper range and, of course, for Zen itself. So it's possible with 12 and M, AMD could potentially counter by reducing the price a little bit more on the 2700X and possibly even introduce the 2800X at a lower price point than Intel. But the key difference, of course, between the 2700X and 2800X is most likely, most likely going to be additional clock speed. What that clock speed is, I don't know. But we can presume it's probably only going to be about two to 300 megahertz at most on top of the current 2700X. And that's most likely into um, AMD using the best quality silicon, so really uh, using silicon binning to their advantage and, pre and uh, pretty much using the 2800X as like the premium product. Intel's Larrabee architecture is one of the more fascinating tales in tech history, at least in my opinion. While Intel at the time were trying to design their own graphics chip with a very distinct flavor of Intel, it was x86 based, it eventually ended up, of course, being the Xeon Phi. However, since that time, Intel have now put a lot of dedication, of course, into their own graphics chips. Obviously, they've seen that lucrative monies that Nvidia and now AMD are chasing in the data center and HPC, and of course, gaming as well. So now they're trying to design their own graphics card. Raja Kodori, formerly the head of RTG slash AMD, um, the AMD graphics division, uh, Radeon Technologies Group, is now uh, heading up this project over at Intel, and he has hired Tom Forsyth. Now, if Tom Forsyth was actually instrumental in the creation of the Larrabee, uh, sorry, of Larrabee itself, and has recently been working at stints at Valve and Oculus, where he's been doing VR stuff. Now, he describes himself as a graphics programmer and chip designer and he has said that he's going to be working under Raja Kodori but he doesn't exactly know right now what he's going to be doing although we can put two and two together on his behalf and we can certainly make some speculation most likely he's going to be designing some aspect of the GPU whether that's going to be more virtual reality based whether that's going to be gaming whether that's going to be for we know he's going to be designing the packaging that the darn thing comes in. And I don't mean the actual silicon package, by the way. I literally mean the cardboard box. There's a lot of options that he could be working on. What fascinates me, though, is that I want to know what Intel are going to be doing for our 
Arctic and Jupiter sounds, because don't forget, Larrabee was x86 based and AMD clearly are also changing the fundamentals of their GPUs. I covered AMD's Super SIMD architecture at length about, um, about a month ago, I believe, which was based on the design patents that we'd seen emerge online. For those unfamiliar, I'll try to remember to link it in the video description. It's rather fascinating, actually, what approach they're taking. But we're looking at an amalgamation of the work with GCN, Graphics Core Next, which, of course, using a SIMD design and also VLIW, very long instruction word. What was really interesting about this GPU, if it comes to fruition and if it's something that we're going to see this time, you know, the next 20 years, is that it aims to provide the benefits of both and helps to, and would, at least in theory, mitigates the drawbacks of both. With GCN, it was much better at compute-based workloads, but when it comes to gaming workloads, there is some optimization issues there. But of course, with the asynchronous compute shaders and stuff, that can somewhat help with the graphics uh, bubbles, sorry, um, with the graphics pipeline bubbles can be mitigated by, you know, use of compute shaders and stuff. So there is some, certainly some good there. But on VLIW, it's really great for graphics workloads. The problem is for compute workloads, it really required a lot of shader optimization. I'm sorry, it required a lot of uh, compiler optimization, not shader optimization. A lot of compiler optimization, so it was not necessarily 100% ideal in that regard either. So what we're left with, at least according to uh, those details, is the, the, the best of both worlds. And I'm going to be very curious to see what Intel are going to be doing. I'm going to be curious if they are going more of a traditional GPU that we're used to right now, or if we're going to see something completely different, if we're going to be seeing something that is not necessarily Larrabee, but has some of the core elements of Larrabee. In other words, it's a smarter, more efficient GPU. There's a lot of, there's a lot of potential there. And Intel, and I know I keep saying this, but Intel are not a broke company. They've got a lot of money. And I was actually talking with someone today, and I said that in a way, AMD uh, has actually kind of awoken a giant with Intel. Not only are Intel now being a lot more aggressive on the CPU side, but they're also now aggressive on the GPU side. And to be fair, Nvidia kind of poking them in the rib every so often with a stick has probably not helped Intel there. And just because it makes business sense. And while this is completely and utterly the reverse, or not even slightly the same topic, it kind of reminds me of Microsoft and Sony. I said during the E3 press conference and our coverage of the E3 press conference of Microsoft, Sony may actually be in trouble in the future because of the sheer amount of cash that Microsoft can throw behind the Xbox. I'm going to be doing a full analysis actually of the next generation Xbox pretty soon. Uh, I've actually written a ray tracing on the Xbox um, script, so I'm hoping to film that tomorrow. Uh, I'm supposed to do it today, but let's just say stuff happened, <laughs> as things tend to do sometimes. But anyway, it's written, uh, so I'm hopefully going to be filming it tomorrow. I'm actually going to be have to well, basically I've got to be kind of bright and early and stick around anyway because we're expecting a couple of parcels over the next few days for yet more review samples plus as well I need to start benchmarking this as well so I'm going to be pretty busy over the next few days uh, but anyway I, I digress and Intel have a lot of disposable income and so it's going to be very curious to see whether they go the more tried and true method or whether they're going to design stuff with more flair <laughs> I'm, I mean, if nothing else, it's going to be cool to see what Intel do. And don't forget their own internal schedule. Intel have confirmed that they are looking to release what we could presume to be Arctic Sound in 2020. And we can presume Jupiter Sound is going to happen like, I don't know, a year or two later. It's supposedly the generation after that. I'm looking forward to seeing what Intel do because I just want to see the coolest products and hopefully at a good price. What is somewhat less good news for Intel, and yes, probably impacting AMD as well, is OpenBSD. Specifically news that the uh, Linux-based distribution is going to be removing support for hyper-threading and most likely SMT as well. Why? Well, it really comes down to security. The problems we've had recently with security with Intel and to a degree as well, uh, AMD as well as ARM and other processors, has really been in the news recently and ultimately one of the 
biggest, um, I guess you could say, flaws could be really down to SMT. Mark Ketnas of OpenBSD actually wrote a rather lengthy post explaining this, but the synopsis is that the level one cache as well as the translation lookaside buffer TLB is shared quite considerably between both threads on a virtual, or so on a single core. So what happens is you can get a lot of security issues there. So the first port of call for them to do was to disable Intel's hyperthreading, which is pretty much their version of SMT, and on the x86 platforms. But before you say, ha ha ha, Intel, ha ha ha, AMD to the win. Unfortunately, no, most likely the company are going to be doing the same for not only 32-bit, but also for other vendors. So of course, that would also include AMD on that. Now, there are some bright sides. The primary bright side, other than the fact that it should be in theory be more secure, is that according to OpenBSD's own testing, and I stress that, own testing, performance degradation is not that bad, and therefore, in theory at least, you won't get hit over the head so bad, so awfully if you're in an environment where you were using these features. With that said, though, um, a lot of virtual machines work is also not particularly done with OpenBSD. Typically, you might have VMware work on a completely different environment, so most likely, it won't necessarily impact cloud providers who need to allocate a certain number of threads to a certain client, and obviously that would be bad. So most likely this is going to be more internal type of uh, situations like internal teams who are using uh, OpenBSD for a specific project. With that said, I do know an awful lot of you do work in cloud environments and server environments and so on. So if you do or you manage, you know, high performance computing type of systems, do let me know your opinions on this. And more to the point, if you're running benchmarks, also let me know as well. You can, of course, find further details in the comments down below, or you could just email me at paul at redgamingtech.com. Anyway, with all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Normal stuff, like, share, comment, and subscribe, and thanks to everyone who has been subscribing and supporting us recently. It means an awful lot, honestly. It's been absolutely fantastic, and yeah, I'm just, I'm really pleased, and I'm really happy that everyone's been enjoying the content. There will be a lot more over the next couple of days. Unfortunately, right now, it's just been a lot of script writing and just kind of getting things ready for uh, multiple reviews. But as I said, there will be a ray tracing video because I know a lot of people have been asking for more information regarding uh, the next generation Xbox as well. So I've done all of the due diligence for that. So I'm going to be writing a script for the uh, PlayStation 5 and next generation Xbox specifications. That will be after the ray tracing. I've also got a Ryzen IPC video, which is going to be coming up over the next several days as well. Hopefully get that up, uh, up excuse me, over the weekend. We have a desktop that we're going to be reviewing over the next couple, or over the next week or so, most likely. Uh, we've got a motherboard that we're going to be testing and just a whole bunch more besides. And there's going to be some fun content coming on the channel as well. So, you know, if you're not already subscribed, well, you know, click the bell icon, damn it. And if you are subscribed already, then just thanks very much for the support. It means so much to me and Amy as well, who, you know, has been doing a lot more editing recently, but she'll be making some content as well. She's got a couple of ideas. With all of that said, thanks very much and uh, take care of yourselves. Bye for now. <laughs>